Welcome to the lab, everyone. Today, we're taking you up to 10,000 feet to talk about what altitude does to the human body. The body undergoes some incredible physiological adaptations when exposed to higher altitudes, and it includes more than just creating some extra red blood cells. So in this video, we'll learn about all these amazing adaptations, as well as talk about what training at altitude can do for athletic performance, and discuss if it's worth it, how high you need to go, and how much you can actually expect to improve your physical performance. It's going to be an elevated one. So let's do this. So it's been known for quite some time now that a person that remains at high altitudes for days, weeks, or years becomes more and more acclimatized to that higher altitude. And as someone gets more acclimatized, those higher altitudes cause fewer negative effects to the body and it becomes possible for the person to work harder or perform better without hypoxic effects and to even ascend to higher altitudes. And if you haven't heard the term hypoxic or hypoxia before, hypo refers to low or below and the ox portion of the word refers to oxygen. So in other words, hypoxia refers to low amounts of oxygen reaching the tissues. And let's talk about why someone develops hypoxia at higher altitudes. And this will help us to clarify a few things about terms that can sometimes be a little misleading. Often people will say that the air is thinner or that there's less oxygen at higher altitudes. But again, this can be a little misleading. Oxygen makes up about 21% of the atmospheric gases, whereas nitrogen makes up about 78%, with carbon dioxide and some others making up less than 1%. These percentages don't change, whether you're at sea level, 10,000 feet or close to 30,000 feet at the top of Mount Everest. What does change is the atmospheric pressure. And it's this decrease in atmospheric pressure, specifically the pressure of oxygen, that leads to the problems of hypoxia that occurs at higher altitudes. And so I find this graph to be pretty helpful. As you can see, atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. And oxygen would contribute to about 21% of that pressure. So if we do some quick math, 21% of 760 is 159. So the pressure of oxygen at sea level is about 159 millimeters of mercury. And at 10,000 feet, where we just were, you can see total atmospheric pressure is 523 millimeters of mercury with oxygen contributing 110 millimeters of mercury. And you can see on the chart the decrease in pressure as we continue to move up in altitude. And again, referencing the highest place on Earth, Mount Everest, which is 29,029 feet, the partial pressure of oxygen is just over 50 millimeters of mercury, which is about three times less than the pressure of oxygen found at sea level. But oxygen always contributes to about 21% of that pressure. So what this means is that with less pressure moving into our lungs, less oxygen will be forced through the alveoli of our lungs and into our bloodstream. And you could actually measure this with a pulse ox on your finger. And I actually did that when we got up to 10,000 feet. I normally run at about 98% oxygen saturation at my house, which is at about 4,700 feet. But at 10,000 feet, I was at about 93 to 94%. So what does your body exactly do when exposed to higher altitudes? Well, how we are going to approach this is by breaking this down into the acute adaptations, or in other words, what the body does right when it is exposed to higher altitudes and then the adaptations that start to occur if someone continues to be exposed to high altitudes for days, weeks, and even months. And to help us with this, we are going to recruit 10,000 foot Jonathan. Well, thank you, Lab Jonathan, and welcome to 10,000 feet. And if we were actually able to transport or teleport you immediately from say like sea level all the way up to 10,000 feet, your body would have these initial physiological responses or these acute responses to the higher altitude or higher elevations. One, would, you would notice that your respiratory rate would increase. You'd be breathing more frequently and more heavily. You'd also have your heart rate increase. And the idea behind this is you're trying to compensate for the lower atmospheric pressure and oxygen isn't being forced into your body as efficiently. So now, what happens if we remain exposed to the higher altitude? Will we always have to breathe as heavily and increase our heart rate to the same level? Well, no, because over time, if we remain exposed, our bodies can create other adaptations. The first that many people that train at elevation will talk about is increase in the number of red blood cells, which are the cells that carry oxygen throughout our bodies. And again, 
Hypoxia is the principal stimulus for causing this increase in red blood cell production as hypoxia stimulates the kidneys to secrete a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO. This then circulates to the inside of your bones called spongy bone and tells or stimulates your red bone marrow to start producing more red blood cells. And this actually starts happening right when you are exposed to higher altitudes. But it does take time to build up enough new red blood cells before you'll have a noticeable improvement in say like physical performance. And we'll get into the timing and how long one needs to stay at elevation before noticing these benefits when we talk more specifically about training at elevation later on in the video. But in addition to increasing the number of red blood cells, overall blood volume will increase. So the fluid component of your blood, the plasma, this can increase up to 20 to 30% in some cases. And so now you have more red blood cells to catch and carry any available oxygen molecule and more volume to deliver more of that blood to your tissues. And one other cool thing that this increased blood volume does is that it increases the diffusing capacity for the oxygen through the alveoli and into the blood because more blood in circulation literally expands the capillaries that surround the alveoli of the lungs. Kind of think of the capillaries as stretching and becoming larger, which in turn increases the surface area through which the oxygen can diffuse into the blood. And speaking of diffusing into the blood, another place we need nutrients to efficiently diffuse into the blood is in the gut. And having proper gut health can help facilitate this process. So I wanna take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Armra Colostrum. Colostrum is a dairy bioactive whole food produced by all mammals in the first 48 to 72 hours after giving birth. It's the first nutrition that we receive, packed with vital nutrients our bodies need to thrive. Armor delivers the power of colostrum in a digestible form with over 400 functional nutrients like peptides, antibodies, and antioxidants. These nutrients can support your cells, gut, immune system, as well as strengthen your mucosal barriers that help guard against environmental threats. One of the great things about Armour is that it is the only colostrum to use cold chain biopotent pasteurization, which is this unique process that helps keep the over 400 bioactive nutrients found in Armour active and functional, ensuring you get the maximum benefits. It's recommended to take three to four scoops daily and you can mix it in with any cool beverage. And since it's a bioactive whole food, you can adjust that amount as needed. So if you're interested, we've worked out a special offer for our audience and you can receive 15% off your first order by going to tryarmor.com slash institute15 or enter the code institute15 to get that 15% off your first order. That's T-R-Y-A-R-M-R-A dot com slash institute15. Another cardiovascular adaptation that occurs during the acclimatization process builds off the previous two. And this is growth of more capillaries in the tissues throughout the body. So if we take muscle tissue, for example, and you have more blood vessels, you can now take that extra volume of blood and those extra red blood cells that are carrying the oxygen to a working skeletal muscle. You can also get adaptations at the cellular level. Increases in the number of mitochondria occur, which we all probably remember that the mitochondria can utilize that oxygen in conjunction with fats or carbohydrates to generate the energy currency of our cells called ATP. And so up to this point, you can see that we've created all these adaptations to help us use oxygen more efficiently. But another cellular adaptation that occurs in muscle fibers and other cells throughout the body is an increase in the number of glycolytic enzymes. Now you may have heard of glycolysis, which is the anaerobic energy system that makes ATP without the presence of oxygen. So the body being exposed to hypoxia or higher altitudes will also make our anaerobic energy system more efficient. So after going through all of these adaptations that can occur due to being at a higher altitude, you may have noticed that these adaptations seem very similar to many of the adaptations we get with exercise. And there's no doubt that many people who are born at and live at high altitude would have a greater exercise or work capacity. But what if someone were to try to do both, have a vigorous exercise routine and expose themselves to high altitude? And professional athletes and even some of the serious recreational athletes will train at altitude with the hopes of further enhancing these physiological adaptations. So there are some questions we need to answer. How high do you need to go? How long do you need to stay there? How much of a difference does it really make from a performance standpoint? And 
there have emerged different schools of thought, such as live high, train high, or live high, train low. And so we'll explain what each of those scenarios means and why you might choose one over the other. So first, how high do you need to go? Well, you can find articles saying as low as 5,500 feet all the way up to 9,500 feet. But many experts and trainers tend to agree that around 7,000 feet is a good place to start. It's high enough that you can provide enough of a stimulus for the body to create these adaptations, but not too high to where you're going to cause any problems. Because there are people, especially those that live at lower elevations, that could develop altitude sickness if they went too high too fast. But most can tolerate 7,000 feet. Something else to consider with going too high initially is that this could make it so your training isn't as efficient. And we'll talk more about that in just a second when we compare live high, train high versus live high, train low. But how long would you need to spend at altitude to get a significant enough of an adaptation that would cause a noticeable improvement in athletic performance? Now remember, I mentioned that as soon as the body experiences hypoxia, it is going to immediately react with increased respiratory rate and heart rate but the kidneys will even start to produce more EPO immediately upon experiencing hypoxia, and those EPO levels will continue to rise throughout even that first day of exposure. So the body is going to start the process of producing red blood cells almost immediately, but again, it takes time to build up enough of them, as well as to create more capillaries, mitochondria, and intracellular enzymes before all of this translates to a measurable increase in athletic performance. And most experts recommend staying at least three to four weeks at that higher altitude to get measurable performance improvements, with four to six weeks likely being even more ideal. And before we get into how much performance improvement one can get from training at higher altitudes, let me explain two of the more common training routines that I've mentioned. Live high, train high, and live high, train low. Each approach has its pros and cons. With live high, train high, it means kind of exactly how it sounds you're going to live at a higher altitude as well as train at that higher altitude. The pros of this is that an athlete would constantly be exposed to hypoxic conditions, and because all aspects of life, including sleep, exercise, and recovery, are done at high altitude, this could potentially lead to more comprehensive physiological adaptations. Some of the cons of this approach could be that due to lower oxygen availability, it may be challenging to maintain higher training intensities, potentially limiting the quality of those higher intensity workouts. Constant exposure to high altitude may also lead to increased fatigue and slower recovery times, making it difficult to sustain more intense training plans. With live high, train low, someone would live at higher altitude but train at a lower altitude. A pro of this would be that an athlete could maintain a higher training intensity during those training sessions due to more oxygen availability in the body potentially leading to better overall performance gains. So the overall idea being athletes could still reap the benefits of living at high altitude, increasing red blood cells, increased capillarization, as well as the other adaptations we talked about, while training more effectively at the lower altitudes. But there are some cons to this as well, including some logistical cons. In order to do this, you would have to be in a place where high altitude is in close enough proximity to where you could drive to a lower altitude almost every time you train throughout a given week. That takes more time and likely more money. And while this training method still works well, the time spent in hypoxic conditions is less than live high, train high. Plus, some athletes may have a race at a higher altitude, so many people may still want to do some race-specific training sessions at that altitude to stimulate the race environment. Now, some people will try to get the best of both worlds by combining or hybridizing these two methods. Big Bear California comes to mind because Big Bear California is at about at 7,000 feet. Plus, you can go higher if you go on some of the hikes in the mountain ranges that are available there. But it's in close enough proximity where people could drive maybe about an hour and get all the way down to close to 1,000 feet. So in this way, people can live in Big Bear, do some training sessions at that higher elevation, then maybe one to two times a week, drive down to the lower elevation for those very highly intense exercise sessions to get an even greater exercise training stimulus. So how much can training at higher altitudes improve athletic performance? And I need to actually make sure I'm clear here. This is about improving endurance, like for cycling, distance running, and swimming. Training at altitude isn't going to magically make your one rep max of your squat or deadlift improve. 
But for endurance, the data shows that you could get an improvement in performance that ranges anywhere from about 2 to 5% for fairly competitive athletes. But as you start getting even more fit, it seems to be that it will make less of a difference as highly trained elite athletes see about a 1 to 2% improvement. Now, 2 to 5% doesn't sound like a lot. So you might be thinking, is training at elevation or higher altitudes even worth it? Well, it depends on a few things. First, 2 to 5% isn't actually that bad. For example, let's say you had an 18 minute 5K time. That's not elite, but that's also not a slow 5K. A 2% improvement would be running 21 to 22 seconds faster. And a 5% improvement on an 18 minute 5K would be 56 seconds faster. That's definitely a noticeable difference. But it's hard to know where you're going to fall in this 2 to 5% range. Like for example, I mentioned that I live just below 5,000 feet. And I love running these Spartan obstacle course races, which are these trail runs mixed with monkey bars, rope climbs, sandbag carries, and various other obstacles. So I spend a lot of time in the mountains trail running at altitudes that range from six to 9,000 feet. So even if I decided to book a hotel room for a few weeks at a nearby ski resort that was at like seven to 8,000 feet, I'm not likely going to get as big of a change or improvement as someone that lives and trains at sea level. Also, something that needs to be stated here is that training at altitude should be approached like the icing on the cake to your training, meaning that you should first be extremely consistent in your ability to stick to and complete an effective training plan before worrying about going and training at higher altitudes. Once you've got that dialed in though, and if you have the time and the resources to train at higher altitudes, it could potentially give you a competitive edge. Even the elite competitive athletes will still take that potential for only a 1% to 2% increase in performance, because these are the people that are pretty much doing this for their job, competing in the Olympics and other high profile competitions. So the possibility for a 1% to 2% improvement could push them to that podium finish.